morning, everyone. Welcome to First Unitarian Church and Happy Easter. I'm Angela Herrera, the senior minister, and I'm here with our associate minister, Bob Lavalley, our ministerial intern, Jane Davis, and our music director, Susan Peck. Whether you are a longtime member or a new visitor or somewhere in between, we welcome you. And wherever you're located, whether you're here in New Mexico or in Maryland or Illinois or Washington or somewhere farther away, we're glad you're with us. Wherever you are in your spiritual journey, you're welcome in this congregation where we like to say, we need not think alike to love alike. It's beautiful to be together this morning. We have created a service that is as diverse as the rooms from which we gather this morning. A little fire, a little humor, kids, grown-ups, music, prayer, and short homilies linking spring, Passover, and Easter to this month's theme of liberation. It's a service that we hope will be of service, that together the pieces, like little lily pads, will maybe help carry you some of the way through this time. I have a few announcements before we begin. First, you may have heard in the news about some people intentionally disrupting church services on Zoom. Now we've taken steps to discourage that kind of thing, most of which are behind the scenes, but there are a couple of areas where you can help. First, if any person or group posts something inappropriate in our chat box, our ushers are going to remove them from the service. And in the meantime, you can help by typing words like love or peace into the chat box so that any offensive messages get buried and are just no longer visible. Second, we encourage you not to click on any links in the chat box unless they come from one of the service leaders and better yet, we verbally acknowledge that we are putting the link there. Unfortunately, sometimes internet trolls pretend to be people we know and post bad links. So unexpected links are a security risk. We encourage you not to click on them. The link that was posted earlier, that's a link to our visitor card by Bob Lavalley. That's a great link. So if you're a new visitor, we encourage you to click that one. Finally, if any issue, technical or otherwise, ever causes a service to end prematurely, we're going to post a recorded service on the church website as soon as possible. Speaking of recorded things, we want more videos of the children's affirmation. Families, we would love to feature your children, and we want teenagers too. All you need is the script, and that's important because it has more words than the affirmation. You just need to get the script from Mia Norin, and then you can just record it with something like a smartphone. We encourage you to invite your friends to do it too. And now Susan is going to help us start the service with the chalice lighting. Good morning. If you'd like to light a chalice with me, please get your candle or chalice ready. Our call to worship comes from Reverend Gretchen Haley. This is a call for all the people longing for liberation, all who wander too often in the desert, not sure of the way forward, thirsty and afraid, looking for water. Here is a call to collect ourselves and the hopes we have tucked away set aside too often for another day. Here we are building a welcome table that never finds its end, a river that cannot run dry. The waters are always rapid and then still, steady, and then waterfalls. There is nothing tidy or perfect possible in this journey. Abundant life is messy and glorious, filled with risk. This is a call for the diving in with all the dreams of your heart, the struggles, the silliness, the fear, the hunger, the courage, the community, the love. Here we remember the time for joy is always now. Good morning, everybody, and happy Easter to all. Good morning! It's Easter time, so it's time to sing some alleluias. 
So I thought we could sing one of our congregational favorites. I know the kids enjoy this one because you get to move around a little bit and everybody's wanting to move around a little bit these days. So you have to choose. You can sing with me and sing the Alleluia's and you stand up or throw your arms up when you're singing. Or you sing with her and you sing, sing and rejoice and you stand up when you do that part. So we'll do it both ways here. We'll do it three times through, getting faster every time. Here we go. Hallelujah, 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 sing. I'm Corbett. Please join us in the children's affirmation. We are Unitarian Universalists. We are people of faith with open minds, loving hearts, and helping hands. Thank you. That was so sweet. I love it when the kids lead us in the children's affirmation. I've been thinking about all the Unitarian Universalist kids this week. Easter is so different this year. We had so many things planned at the church, a big service with the choir singing a song that would fill the whole sanctuary and special activities for families, but those things just aren't possible. And this week, we can't even go to the sanctuary, not even teleporting, in order to see the puppets. We really have to stay at home right now. Gosh, I miss them. And I've actually been feeling a little blue I know many of you can probably relate to that. You've had to change your plans for birthdays and for other special days. I hope all you kids got Easter baskets at least. I've been wondering about Rebecca Rabbit. She's usually so tired on Easter morning from delivering Easter baskets all night long. But I guess we won't see her today. Unless, could it really work? No, I mean, well, maybe it's worth a try. Do you think the puppets could teleport here to my house? Let's call them and see what happens. Will you come closer and help me? Let's call Rebecca for sure. And how about Carl? Okay, ready? Rebecca, Rebecca, Carl, Carl. Oh my gosh, it worked. <laughs> Where are you? You're in my house. Welcome. Oh, Rebecca, you do look tired. Have you been out delivering Easter baskets all night? You have? <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh, and you're giving me the last piece of candy? That's sweet. Oh, wow. Is that Easter grass? Oh, that's so nice of you. I think I'm gonna save it for later, okay? I'm sure it's delicious. Oh my goodness, oh, you really do look tired. Rebecca, don't you think you should take a long Easter's nap? No, but Rebecca, you seem to be falling asleep right now. You know, there's a cozy spot under my desk where you could curl up and go to sleep. I think that's probably a good idea. She'll be really comfortable down there. <laughs> She's so sweet. Oh. Hi, Olivia. Good to see you. Hey, it's Passover for you. Are you having a good holiday? Well, I guess Passover is pretty different for you this year, isn't it? What's that? Oh, all your owl family usually comes over for a big dinner and stories. And it's just not the same being by yourself. Yeah, I'm feeling that way about Easter too. But Carl, you look like your normal self. 
Aren't you missing anything at this time of year? You aren't? Isn't Easter special for you, Carl? It is? Okay, what's special for you on Easter? It's special because a lot of people do a bunch of extra worship of God and you think of yourself as a God. I see. And it's always a special day when you are worshiped. Okay. Well, I'm not sure that all of this extra worship is for you, Carl, being that you're just a minor deity in some religions as a coyote, right? But you know, I think that you are on to something else. Easter is not just about a special church day and a lot of people together. It's about what's behind those things, about love being stronger than death. And it's about how things can seem terrible and sad, but they get better, just like winter turning into spring. It's about how people work together to help each other and to live their vision of a loving life, even in hard times. Yes, Easter is about times just like this time. Thanks, Carl. <laughs> What's that, Olivia? Oh, okay. Let me see if I got all that. Passover is not just about guests and family and good food. It's about remembering how hundreds of years ago, the Jewish people escaped slavery. And now you're celebrating freedom and resilience. That's very wise, Olivia. Thank you for reminding us about that. And thank you, Carl, for reminding us that it's the meaning of the holiday that's important, not where we celebrate it or how many people are with us. That's a really important truth, even if we don't share your particular theology. <laughs> so are you going back to church now? No? Teleporting makes you dizzy, so you want to stay at my house? Oh my goodness. The three of you puppets are going to double the population in my little house, but also the fun. So, okay, sure, at least for a few days. But right now it's time to say goodbye, okay? Will you help me? Goodbye, 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 puppets. I know it's always hard to deal with all the changes we've been dealing with. For me, the biggest thing is not being able to rehearse with the choir and have wonderful music for you with the choir. But we do have wonderful music. We've been working on some virtual choir projects, so please join us in singing Spirit of Life by Carolyn McDade. to hear the choir. Let's enter into a time of meditation. Maybe you find a comfortable seat. I know we're all leaning over our Zoom devices, our computers, and our iPads, and, and uh, whatever it is that we're watching on. Let's find a comfortable place to be. Join me in a couple deep breaths. Inhale your shoulders up to your ears, and exhale. Let them soften down. Inhale up, 
Exhale down. One more time. Inhale, inhale up. And exhale down. We're now going to enter into three minutes of silence. And I'm going to turn off my spotlight video, which will allow you to switch into gallery mode. And if you're comfortable, we'd love to see your face. So if you can turn on your camera, if you're on a tablet or a computer, that'd be great. So nice to see this gathered community. And as we come into this time of silence, if you'd like, I invite you to turn your attention to your breath. Don't try to control it, change it. Simply be, be a witness to your breath. Let's enter the silence. May I tell you how beautiful it is to see your faces? All these joys and concerns and the joys and concerns that we hold in our hearts unspoken, we lift these up to the powers of healing and renewal that are known by many names. Blessed be. Will you join me in the spirit of prayer? We're grateful for spring and board games and family. We're concerned for decisions of our leadership or the vulnerable among us. Hmm. 
we pray for Carla Williams, who's in the hospital, and her partner, Sarah McCord, and their family. May the love of their family be multiplied as they push through this hardship. We lift up Carmen Samora and her family as they mourn the loss of her brother, David. May they find consolation and comfort in memories of David. We lift up little Lily, the young niece of Michelle and Matt Watkins. She's working hard to heal from leukemia. We hold her and our family and their family in our love. We ask for blessings on the Unitarian Universalists residing at La Vida Yena Living Senior Living Center and for all the residents and staff there as they mourn the losses in their midst. May they find safety and support. We remember the detainees held in unsafe conditions in ICE detention centers and all who are incarcerated. May they be treated justly and may they know that they have inherent worth. We pray for the Navajo Nation as they struggle to contain the virus in the context of a long history of oppression. May they find healing. Remember those who care for children and for the elderly and for the sick. May they know that by the work of their hands, they bring love into the world. We lift up all who are lonely. May they feel the bonds of their larger community. We give thanks for this gathered community, for the power of connection to ground us and carry us through our isolation days. We give thanks we give thanks for the many ways that this congregation shows up for each other, for the larger community, and for the common good. May our, may our efforts create a more just and caring world. And may we all be held in the heart of love. Peace be with you. Good morning. It is clear that spring is here now. There is new growth bursting forth all around us. Now we just moved to a new location and it's a beautiful location. You can tell it's on a busy street, but it has these beautiful trees in the front yard. But not much over a month ago, this tree was stark and leafless. It was so stark that I wondered if it was still alive. But my partner, Ray, showed me how to tell for sure that a plant is still alive. You look for the green inside. So outward appearances can make a living thing look lifeless, but the proof of life is found by what we see inside. She took a small branch 
and looked deeper inside and there was green in there. She assured me that the tree was not dead and it would sprout new life in the spring. And that is exactly what it's doing. I was born in the spring and I am reminded that soon another year of my life will have passed and another spring of my life is coming into bloom. I once looked at my life in a very linear way, following a straight line from beginning to end. In that linear thinking, I never imagined that someday I would take my life in a very different direction than I had originally planned. And I never imagined that making such a change would cause me to feel as though my life is headed into a new spring following a rather harsh winter. This has also gotten me to look at my life in seasons. We humans often compare the span of our lives to the seasons. When we make this comparison, we usually start with spring and end with winter. I have often wondered why we do not form this comparison in a way that more closely reflects nature. If we looked at our lives as more like the seasons, would we look at our lives differently? Would we then consider that there are cycles in our lives and in the events of our lives? Our lives are not linear, starting in spring and ending in nature. In nature, the cycle repeats. Winter is followed by a new spring. That new spring is abundant with new growth. The new growth is, was made stronger and more vibrant by water from the winter snows. This is also true in our lives and in the events of our lives. The spring times are often much richer and more abundant because of the winter harshness. In these comparisons with the seasons of nature, we are reminded of the teachings of Buddhism. In Buddhist teachings, we are urged to accept change and not to cling to what we consider the good or to push away what we consider the bad. We are reminded to accept change with equanimity, equanimity or evenness of mind. This evenness of mind allows us to accept all the seasons of our lives not just the spring, but also the winters. We are also encouraged to do the same with the seasons of our lives, with the events of our lives. We are apt to want to rush through the down times of our lives and focus on getting through them quickly to more pleasant times. We seem to find little value in the winters when things are bleak, dormant, not growing, not brilliant, not colorful. We could imagine nature as showing equanimity or evenness of mind. Nature seems to embrace the winters with faith that the winters are necessary. If we took nature as our guide, would we be able to be still, embrace the cycle, and see that it is the snows of winter that permit the growth in spring? Would we also give ourselves and our communities permission to burst forth into a new spring season following a harsh and cold and dormant winter? I hope each of us can embrace the spring season and embrace the seasons of our lives. All around us, nature is going into spring. Maybe this is a good time for us also to permit a new spring. By that I mean to give ourselves permission to accept the dormant period of current events and prepare ourselves to burst forth boldly and do things differently. To do things differently than we did in the season prior to this harsh season. Perhaps 
we can turn back to the world and the promise of spring with faith. With faith that what we carry from having weathered the winter, the harsh winter, is enough to sustain us in the bursting forth into a new way of being, brilliant with newfound wisdom. Hey there, I'm in my living room and I wanna share a little message about Passover. So the Jewish holiday of Passover started this past Wednesday and it ends next Thursday. And you may have heard the story that this holiday is based on. In the book of Exodus, you can read how God helped the Israelites escape from slavery in ancient Egypt when God told Moses that God would send 10 plagues to Egypt each one worse than the others. So one after another, Moses would threaten the Pharaoh of a plague and the Pharaoh wouldn't budge and then the plague would come. And these are real horror story things like turning the Nile River into blood and making all the fish die and swarms and flies, swarms of flies and gnats covering every animal and human. And my favorite, which is frogs coming up out of the Nile, hopping into people's houses and beds and mixing bowls and ovens. And the, the extra gross twist on that one is that when Moses calls out to God to take away the frogs, God simply has the frogs die. And here's the line from the Hebrew Bible. And the Lord did as Moses requested. The frogs died in the houses and the courtyards and the fields and they gathered them together and the land stank." End of quote. Holy cow, that's gross. <laughs> Anyways, the final plague is when God plans to kill the firstborn child in every house in all of Egypt. But God gives the Jews a way to avoid this. They need to slaughter a lamb and paint the blood of the lamb over the doors of their houses. And the blood sign is a mark that this house should get passed over by God's plague. And that's the origin of the English language name for the holiday, which is Passover. So it's easy to see the parallels with the moment that we're in now. We're certainly in a time of plague. And can anyone think of any contemporary hard-hearted pharaohs? Hmm, I bet that's not hard. Anyways, I can picture us. I can picture us smearing hand sanitizer over the doors of our houses in order to, in hopes that the plague, the COVID, will pass over our homes. Oh man! In earnest, though, during our month of thinking about liberation, Passover is fundamentally a story about the struggle for freedom. We're not free now, and we weren't before this virus thing started. Our plague that we have now reveals the efforts of the pharaohs who've been among us for a century, creating an economy where the workers that we suddenly realize are essential don't make enough to rent an apartment or to house their family or to retire with dignity and security. The pharaohs created an economy where healthcare is tied to employment. And just as people are required to not work or are too sick to work or are taking care of someone who's sick, just then, their work is taken away. And the pharaohs built a society that can't help scapegoating minorities in an epidemic. Right now, it's Asian Americans facing harassment and violence, just as Jews have been scapegoated for so long. Some of us have the privilege to be passed over by these plagues, and some of us don't. And that's one of the really hard parts of the Passover story from Exodus for me. So Moses and Pharaoh have their battle of wills, and most of the people living in Egypt and who are far away from these conversations, they suffer horribly. And they're innocents who are suffering in a struggle over which they have no power. And what happens to one of us happens to all of us. I think it's easy to feel powerless right now. So how do we find liberation from these pharaohs? Where does our power lay, especially in this time of isolation? Over the past week or so, I've been taking a stab at making sourdough bread from scratch. 
So just so you know, I can cook like a boss, but baking is totally foreign, foreign territory to me. So I started a sourdough seed of just with just flour and pineapple juice. And I poked at it for a few days until it showed some signs of life. And then I made the starter with more flour and water. And, and uh, where is it? Here's the, this bowl of goo is my starter. <laughs> and again, eventually it showed some signs of vitality after a few days, but not an overwhelming like, hey, there's a lot of life happening here. Make some delicious bread out of me. So I finally took the leaf leap and I baked a loaf this morning using this starter. And I called my expert baker friend and got a lot of confusing, but mostly helpful advice. And here's where I ended up. Mm, maybe it'll make good toast. <laughs> when the Jews fled Europe, Egypt, they were so afraid that they left their bread dough in the bowls, still without yeast. They had to eat unleavened bread, bread that hadn't, hadn't risen. And that's the origin story for matzah, which is that cracker that you see that's on sale around Passover times. Right now, we need to look for the leavening in our lives. What are the things that give us vitality and the ability to transform basic ingredients like flour and water into something delicious and life-sustaining? How do we transform our state of sl slavery into a freedom that we all share? These are very personal decisions, but a good place to start is to consider the common good. What is in the interest of the common good? And we need to acknowledge that this is gonna be a long haul, both the virus time itself and the work of arriving at true freedom. So there's a, a bittersweet ending to the Passover story. After Passover, after all that trauma and suffering, the Jews entered the wilderness and they wandered for 40 years, 40 years. But they kept to their resolve through many trials and eventually emerged from the, the wilderness. I think we too wander in the wilderness. We will after this plague is over and we don't know for how long. In this time, where we are right now, we need to nurture our leavening, nurture the things that help us grow and transform. I pray that we can do that and support each other in doing that. Blessed be. May it be so. A couple of months ago, when the novel coronavirus was still news from a distant shore, Bob, Jane, Susan, and I sat down to imagine services for today. We're a creative team. I love working together with this team. But I have to say, I would never have guessed that what was going to happen on Easter is puppets would teleport into my living room. I did not see that coming. This is a new kind of wilderness. Now, there are some churches defiantly holding Easter services in person this morning. They join the historical throngs of people who have done what they want because God has a plan. And right about now, God might be wondering why a bunch of messengers in the form of epidemiologists are not convincing enough that the plan to avoid gatherings is the plan, at least for now. It's hard to accept being away from our church, though, and away from those things that are so meaningful to us. What's meaningful is not just a sanctuary or a particular altar or a set of symbols, it's the gathering too. But here I'm going to make a bold claim. I think that no one is better prepared for this than the Unitarian Universalists. For generations, UUs have been practicing our spirituality at the altars of the world. For generations, you use have been practicing our spirituality at all the altars of the world, not just the ones in our churches. We do it by being open and curious about the world's diverse traditions, by honoring many paths to truth, and we do it by being attentive to the natural world, even if nature is nothing fancier than a morning dove on a power line. I think of the Peter Mayer song, Holy Now. He sings, this morning outside I stood, 
and saw a little red-winged bird shining like a burning bush, singing like a scripture verse. Church has spilled out of our sanctuary and it's in your kitchen and it's in my living room and it's in a choir that blends its voices using the invisible threads of the internet and church is in Jane's backyard right in the middle of the city with cars going by. We've created a service that brings those things together and it links spring and Passover and Easter. UUs were made for such a time as this. On the other hand, or at the same time, this approach might also be a little bit of a theological duck and swerve. It's just like the UUs to soften the focus on Easter, moving some of the attention off of the Christian stuff by mixing it up with Judaism and paganism and even a dash of Buddhism today. All this diversity is wonderful and it's the perfect foil to sidestep the uncomfortably, sometimes aggressively theologized story of Jesus's resurrection. To be fair, many UUs have a good reason for wanting to avoid it. Some of us have had Christian dogma used against us, and sometimes it has cost us our relationships with our parents or children or other people we love. And yet, I don't want to just hand these old multi-sided stories over to people who would use them in harmful ways. I think if we give them up, we lose a valuable piece of our spiritual inheritance. We still have need of warnings about pharaohs. And the story of Jesus, including the resurrection, is a living story. Whether the story is historically accurate or not, whether it's true in other ways or in historical ways, that story is still unfolding. And what I mean is that when Jesus doesn't stay dead, the story indicates that it's going to continue. It could have ended there, but it didn't. It indicates that it's going to continue, which it did. And it's like the text might as well conclude with, and now, dear reader, because you have heard it, you are part of the story too. We're in a chapter much further along. Because it is living, the story is meant to be retold and re-understood in each generation, in each context. Back in February, the Reverend Meg Riley visited our congregation to preach about the UU prison ministry. In an essay she wrote several years ago, Meg described an experience that helped lead her to her work now. It was an internship she did when she was a student minister. She did it in the early 1990s at the Church of the United Community in Roxbury, Massachusetts. Many people in that congregation had been in jail or were in recovery or both. Many had the virus, which is what AIDS was called back then. Most had experienced homelessness. There was a lot of violence. And Meg says, poverty blanketed the community. Perpetuating all of that were policies that disproportionately hurt poor people and people of color, like the way people in a place like Roxbury are more likely to go to jail than somebody in the wealthier area, even if they commit the same crime. The effect was a community experience of prolonged suffering and death sanctioned by the state. An experience of prolonged suffering and death sanctioned by the state. In other words, it was a community experience of a kind of crucifixion. You follow? The minister of that church named those things and he preached a theology of liberation. Meg writes, the resurrection was in the gathered community, in the power of oppressed people coming together and claiming their lives as holy. Jesus could not be killed because his community would not allow it. They came together and claimed their lives as holy. As a community, they wouldn't let it be otherwise, just as Jesus could not be killed because his followers would not allow it. That is retelling, re-understanding the Easter story in a living context. As a student minister, Meg was afraid that she would be irrelevant in that congregation, which was so different than the theologies that she had learned all her life and in seminary. Those had been formed in contexts of privilege. Instead, she says she ultimately found her own liberation 
in solidarity with this community. And when she visited us a couple of months ago, she was still engaged in that kind of meaningful work of solidarity. Today, this morning, we experienced this Easter in a new context. We are in the peak days of the first curve of deaths from this thing. As of yesterday afternoon, it has taken the lives of more than 20,000 Americans and tens of thousands more around the globe. The harm, again, falls disproportionately on people who are poor and on people of color. And that's only the count of confirmed deaths from COVID-19. The loss is profound, profound. So this is an Easter in which, like the disciples in the gospel story, we grieve as we look for hope. I know many of us are carrying that grief around in our chests and in our throats every day. You can feel it there. And this is also an Easter to have faith that death does not have the final word in our love for one another or in our relationships for one another. It's an Easter to remember that out of chaos and loss, hope will arise. It's an Easter to remember that our story is still unfinished that when all seems to be lost, our perspective is incomplete. And it is an Easter to remember that our liberation is bound up with each other. There is nothing that could have made our interconnectedness more evident than this pandemic. We were made for such a time as this. From our many altars, we will see it through together. May this circle continue to widen and the love of community continue to deepen as we do. Blessings to you. Before I extinguish our chalice this morning, I want to let folks know that we're offering small group meetings after the service. If you'd like to stay and chat with your fellow congregants, just stay in the meeting and you'll be placed in a group. If you don't want to do that, simply leave the meeting. As we extinguish this chalice, we remember, abundant life is messy and glorious, filled with risk. The time for joy is always now. Be well, my friends, go in light, Go in love, go in peace.
Julian. You are holy. You are holding my hand. And Julian, you are holy. You are holding my hand. She said, all will be well. not know about sorrow and Julian do you not know do you not know about pain and I said Julian do you not know do you not know about hunger and Julian do you not know do you not know about shame but she said all will be well all will be well all Julian, do you not know, do you not know about loneliness? And Julian, do you not know, do you not know about disease? And I said, Julian, do you not know, do you not know about cruelty? I said, Julian, it's too much. It brought me to my knees. But she said, all will be well, all will be well, all No one does not know, does not know about sorrow, and no one does not know, does not know about pain. She said, No one does not know, does not know about hunger, no one does not know, does not know about shame. And she said, All will be well. No one does not know, does not know about loneliness, and no one does not know, does not know about disease. She said, No one does not know, does not know about cruelty. She said, I know it's too much. It brought me to my knees where I heard, All will be well, all will be well. Julian, you are holy, you are holding my hand, and Julian, you are holy, you are holding my hand, she Hold said, hand. all will be well, all will be well, all manner of things will be well, and she said, baby girl, about tenderness she said baby girl do you not know do you not know about friends she said baby girl do you not know do you not know about the spirit she said baby girl do you not know it's only love that never ends and so all will be well